So looking at this image, label the diagrams, highlight the outer ear, middle ear, and inner ear. So the outer ear is the external auditory canal, or the external ear canal, all the way up to this little structure here, which is the tympanic membrane. So that is all the outer ear. The middle ear is from the um, inner aspect of the tympanic membrane to the oval window. And the middle ear includes the ossicles, so the bones of the ear, as well as the eustachian tube. And then the inner ear, <coughs> excuse me, includes the cochlea, which this is the start of the cochlea, and then the vestibule and the semicircular canals, which aren't visible on this image. So looking at labeling this image, we can jump right to your textbook. So we have external auditory canal as noted, so the external ear canal, and then tympanic membrane, which is also known as the eardrum, although that's the common term, so tympanic membrane is the um, anatomical term. And then we have the three ossicles, which are the tiny little bones within the ear, within the middle ear, that vibrate um, and move upon each other to assist in sound production. So they transmit the vibrations from the tympanic membrane toward the cochlea. So we have the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, and then they connect to the open window, which then connects to the cochlea. So this is the start of the cochlea. And just note that this is the cochlear nerve as well. So to put this into perspective, I'm just going to scroll up a little bit because it's a bit of a weird picture. So that, that picture below that we just looked at, so this one, this is the start of the cochlea. And the cochlea is strictly to do with sound, so to do with hearing. So if we look at that, this picture essentially ends at the, uh, the previous picture, has includes the stapes, and then it shows the start of the cochlea. Okay, what it doesn't show is the vestibule that also is attached to um, the oval window and the stapes, further connections, and of course the semicircular canals. And the semicircular canals and the vestibule are strictly associated with equilibrium, so with balance. And we talked about vestibular syndrome in older dogs. That is a disease or a, a condition, technically, that's affected the vestibule in older dogs. Okay, then we've got our eye. Now I'll just go right to the image and show you the <coughs> correct answer to the eye. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so let's just replace this image with this one here. So we've got um, a few terms. This is a human eyeball diagram, so I'll just correct some of the terms that you might see in your textbook. So a couple people asked about the zonules and what the zonules are specifically in animals. And the zonules are often referred to as the suspensory ligament of the eyeball. So suspens suspensory ligament or zonules either are totally acceptable. And what they do is connect the ciliary body with the lens. So the ciliary body is that little ciliary muscle. Same thing, can be used interchangeably. And it assists in the changing of the shape of the lens. Okay, so the zonules are the suspensory ligament that then connect these little ciliary muscles to the lens itself. And don't forget that ciliary muscles are multi-unit smooth muscles. And then we have the sclera, which is the white portion of the eye. We have the cornea, which is the clear, um, most cranial facing portion of the eye. And then we have the anterior chamber, which is uh, just caudal to the cornea, I suppose, we could use that term, and then the posterior chamber, which is subsequently caudal to that. So in the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber, that's where you will find aqueous humor, which is the gel-like substance um, similar to vitreous humor, which is labeled on this image. So you definitely want to know what the chambers are, so anterior chamber, posterior chamber, and then also what fluid is present within them. That's a good one uh, for a quiz, most definitely. And then the iris is the black ring around the eye, um, right there, the iris on either side of the lens. And there's something else I was going to talk about. Oh, the limbus. That's right. Uh, which isn't, it's not even on this one, but I'll show you another image. I think I had another image somewhere. Perhaps not. 
Never mind, just ignore me. Okay, so we'll just carry on. So then the lens, and then we've got the ciliary muscles that we talked about, and the zonules or suspensory ligaments that we talked about. The fovea, keep in mind, this is only for humans. The fovea is not um, existent or well-developed at all for dogs and cats. They don't have that precision in their rods and cones to warrant having an area called the fovea. So we'll just ignore the fovea. The retina is at the very um, back of the eye, so the caudal aspect of the eye. We have the optic disc and the optic nerve. Now this large cavity here between the lens and the retina, within it is vitreous humor. Okay, vitreous humor. And the spelling of humor changes if you're talking about American, British, Canadian. It doesn't matter. I'm okay with either. But just remember that within this chamber, between the lens and the retina, you'll find vitreous humor. And within the anterior and posterior chambers, you're going to find aqueous humor. Now the other uh, change for human versus animal um, anat anatomy would be this one here. So superior rectus muscle and inferior rectus muscle also called the uh, dorsal, oops, just going to decline that, excuse me, um, the dorsal and the ventral rectal muscles, or uh, rectus muscles. And then they also have the oblique ones that come across as well, which would be the lateral oblique. Okay, so that is the eye diagram, so we'll move on from that. And then we had this structure, which identifies some extraocular structures that are really important uh, for you to know about. So what A is pointing to technically is conjunctiva, and that's the conjunctiva that's attached to the sclera. So the eyeball has a lot of connective tissue associated with it, in part is the conjunctiva. So it all works together, obviously, to keep the eyeball in the eye socket. So A, we're looking at conjunctiva, and it's nice and pink. If you printed your sheets in black and white, you obviously can't see that. And then the, <clears throat> the thin white line here, that's the sclera. So the whiteness of the eye is the sclera. C is the iris, so that's the colorful part of the eye. B is the pupil. And D is the nictitating membrane. Okay, also called the third eyelid, but definitely get to know the anatomical term of nictitating membrane. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the limbus is one thing I was just going, oh, that's why I think it was on this one. Yeah, I was going to point out the limbus as well. So the limbus is uh, the border of the cornea and sclera, just to be aware of it. It's very fine, thin fiber structure. And then moving on here, so the inner or the most medial corner of the eye is called the medial canthus. And that's at the, it's at the medial canthus that the nictitating membrane lies. The opposite, so the lateral aspect, is called the lateral canthus. Okay, so medial, lateral. And this will come into play uh, definitely knowing about the medial and lateral canthus, or canthi, technically for plural, uh, because in anesthesia, when you're starting to put an animal under anesthetic or you're wanting them to wake up from anesthetic, we often have our finger and just tap on the medial and lateral um, canthi of the eye and see if either of them produces a blink. And if you're tapping on the medial canthus of the eye and the dog blinks, then we would say it has a medial palpebral reflex. And that's an automatic reflex and it starts to come back after anesthetic. And it's one of our ways that we can get ready to wake that patient up, um, you know, restrain the patient, make sure that their tube's ready to come out, their endotracheal tube, that kind of thing. So medial and lateral canthus of the eye. And this is just another image that you're welcome to have a look at. Help yourself in labeling. So the iris is the colorful part of the eye, the pupils in the center. Cilia, we're talking about eyelashes. Limbus is that fibrous connective tissue between the iris and the sclera. And then the conjunctiva, just to show that it does come along over top of the, the sclera itself. And then the conjunctiva also continues down throughout um, underneath that upper and lower eyelid. <coughs> All right, and then moving on, we've got our image of pain reception. So you had to fill this out. So I just replaced the images so that you can review it and have a look. So we've got uh, the pain process starts with transduction. So down here at the foot, transduction is the conversion of a stimulus into a nerve impulse. 
and then that impulse is transmitted um, of, yeah, sorry, it's transmitted through sensory nerve fibers, so it would be running up along the leg, getting transmitted, and then modulations occurring at the spinal cord, and then finally, last step, is the brain perceives the pain. So when we're talking about pain wind-up, <clears throat> pain wind-up is when we have induced general anesthesia, so we've taken away their reflexes and not necessarily their ability to um, not feel pain, right? We haven't always taken away their ability to feel pain. So what happens during pain wind-up is if an animal is not given pain medication prior to surgery or during surgery, then all those pain receptors are... Um, they're, they're going off throughout surgery. So they're going off, they're going off, there's transduction happening, um, it's getting transmitted, and then it's hanging out, being modulated in the spinal cord. So modulation is continuing to happen during the, on, in the spinal cord all throughout surgery. And then when the animal wakes up, suddenly their brain and all their reflexes are back, and that modulation throws itself up to conscious perception, and all of a sudden, um, all those modulated nerve impulses are being perceived as a massive amount of pain for that dog, cat, cow, horse, etc. So again, pain wind up is when we're not giving pain medication prior to or during surgery and the animal is still modulating the pain and then they perceive it as soon as they wake up. So then they're frantic. So then they have an excessive amount of pain that they're now perceiving. And it's really, really hard to reduce that pain once it's gotten to such a high level in their brain. It's much easier to prevent it. And to prevent it, we give analgesics, so pain medication, analgesic, ahead of surgery, during surgery, and then also after surgery in the recovery phase. And a lot of times we mix an analgesia um, with a sedative to create a nice neurolept analgesia, so a nice sedating um, analgesia. Okay, really important. And that's a huge role of ours is to ensure that our patients are acquiring pain management throughout the whole, all the steps of surgery as required, and then recognizing pain in our patients. Can't tell you how important that is. Okay, then this little pooch, this is a little bulldog. This is called cherry eye. And really, I'm, I'm, it's prolapse of the nictitating membrane gland gland is the anatomical term for it. I'm actually okay if you just call it cherry eye. Uh, it's so rare that we use the anatomical term for it, so cherry eye is perfectly acceptable. So what's happening here is there's a little gland within the nictitating membrane um, that produces a small portion of tears compared to the lacrimal duct. The lacrimal duct produces about 70% of the tears and the nictitating membrane gland produces about 30 or less. And this is a congenital issue, i.e. either born with it. And what happens is that little gland isn't tacked down very well by the typical ligaments that do keep it held down, and it just pops up. And it pops up and out um, away from the eyeball itself. So the little ligaments are no longer holding it in place. And sometimes you see dogs with cherry eye that comes and goes. So some days they might have it, some days they don't. It means that they have a weak ligament there, and it's going to continue to pop up and cause a problem. So this does require surgery, and it's definitely recommended to get it, I was going to say surgerized, but to have surgery performed on it when they're young, so i.e. when they're being spayed or neutered, because there is a risk that they will at some point rely on that nictitating membrane gland for their tear production. So even though it's a lesser amount than the lacrimal duct, um, if they're compromised in any way or just in general, um, they need those that tear production from that gland. So if it's not fixed over time, you can get chronic dry eye, which causes um, ah, ker keratinizing, sorry, um, keratinizing of the cornea. So the cornea becomes hard, thick, dead epithelial cells. And of course, that can affect the vision. So definitely you want to take your animal in have that repaired by a skilled surgeon, of course. Not everybody um, has the same level of skill when it comes to tacking down a cherry eye, but it's a very um, fairly quick, decent, common surgery, um, but important. Skill is very important. So just finding out if this is your animal, uh, what, what the options are, but tacking it down surgically is most ideal. This one, um, everybody might look at this. Oh, and sorry, just going back up. 
Um, also, this is causing conjunctivitis. Okay, so it it's, ends up looking like a large piece of conjunctiva, but really it's inflamed uh, nictitating membrane and a small amount of conjunctiva that's coming out with the cherry eye. So this guy, Basset Hound, super common for these dogs to have this problem. And most people looked at this and thought conjunctivitis. So technically you are right, there is conjunctivitis. Um, but the reason for the conjunctivitis is the outward roll of the eyelids. So the third, or not the third eyelid, the lower eyelid has rolled outward away from the eyeball. And this is called ectropion. Okay, ect, referring to outside, tropion. Um, and what's happening here, the lower eyelid has rolled out. Again, it's congenital, so the animal is typically born with it. Um, also hereditary, same with cherry eye. If the mom and dad, sorry about the dinging, if the mom and dad are... If they both have cherry eye or if one of them has cherry eye, there's a good chance that their puppies or kittens will also have cherry eye. Same with ectropion. So the problem with this is over time, it's going to cause major conjunctivitis because all that soft, moist, yes, moist, 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 conjunctiva is now being chronically exposed to air, dirt, and debris. So it's getting dried out, it's getting inflamed, hence it's resulting in conjunctivitis and of course uh, dry eye as well because it's exposed to the elements. So just going up, this is really, really, really common in uh, hound dogs, right? The big hound dogs, so basset hounds, um, and that's all I can think of right now. <laughs> also in uh, St. Bernard's too. This one, this is called entropion. So en endo, we're thinking inside. And this is where the eyelids, either upper or lower, uh, or typically both, have rolled inward. And this one is really dangerous as well. Uh, it's really common to Sharpays and Chows. And, uh, well, yeah, Sharpays and Chows, it's quite common in general. So what's happening is the eyelids are rolling, rolling inward. And what are eyelids covered in? For dogs and cats, they're covered in hair. So they're colored in, covered in the eyelashes, but then also in their fur as well. So what's happening are those eyelids are rolling inward. And you can see here, that's a big... It looks like corneal scarring, so it's old corneal ulcer um, that's causing a major problem for that dog, I'm sure. And you can see a whole bunch of the staining here and staining here, chronic tear production. So what's happening is that hair is constantly scratching the eyeball. And of course, they can end up with massive corneal ulcers from this, corneal scratchers, um, chronic pain, and really, really severe uh, problems with their eyes. They can actually lose their sight pretty significantly because of entropion. And both entropion and ectropion, there are surgeries to correct those. So they're, again, you want to make sure that you're taking your animal to a very skilled surgeon who is confident and comfortable performing the surgery and has had a lot of successful cases without recurrence. That's the key because it is eye surgery. It's very, very delicate. Well, it's extraocular structure surgery. Okie dokie. So know about those. Um, so again, common to Sharpays, the entropian, ectropian, really common to basset hounds, uh, big droopy dogs. And cherry eye is common to uh, shih tzus, little dogs, little white dogs, you typically see it, um, but any dog can get it. And this is another one, they're all very much hereditary, so they're passed down from mom to uh, pups. That being said, all three of these conditions more often affect dogs than cats. It's fairly rare for cats to be affected by any of these three conditions. That's it. That's it. That's all.